at uh, Destination Dallas in Plano, Texas with a man that should need no introduction to you, the legendary Bill Kazmaier. And I just want to say, this is something when um, I was writing my bench press book and all this, I was like really trying hard to get in touch with Kaz. I wasn't able to because earlier in my career, he gave me a bunch of great advice in my bench press. So it's really an honor to sit down with him and let him share a lot of that advice with everybody here watching. So welcome. Thanks, Josh. Thanks a lot. So tell us a little bit how you got started in the Iron Game. Mm, gosh, how far back do I go? In the fifth grade, I had just won the track meet in the 50, the 100, and the 400, and I snuck into the gym one night. Now, the gym being basketball, two locker rooms. I heard something really weird as I went into the gymnasium in the girls' locker room. It wasn't laughing in giddy, goofy stuff from the girls. It was like a clanging noise. I went up to the door, and I, I knocked rather timidly. Mr. Nas let me in. And now I'm a kid who's playing Wipeout all the time. I'm fidgety and got ADD and kind of messed up uh, from a broken home. He let me in and he said, I said, can I watch? And he said, all right, we got to be quiet. And I was. And I, in my quiet, watched him take 150 through his shoulders and press it over his head. And then 175 and then 185. And he weighed about just under 200. Evidently, he was trying to press his own body weight. He missed at 190, so he didn't do his own body weight. And he seemed rather frustrated. He didn't talk much. He started to take the bar apart and put the weights away underneath the lockers. And I said, wait, can I try my body weight? He said, all right, Bill, what do you weigh? I said, I weigh 110 pounds. He left that much on the bar. I reached down without any instruction. I watched him do it. It seemed pretty easy. Take it to the shoulders. Didn't know it was called a power clean. And then press overhead to arm's length. I did it once rather easily. I probably could have done it five times. I'm 10 years old. <laughs> I'd never seen a weight before. I set it down, and the words that came out of his mouth still ring in my ears today. When I'm in front of schools, 10 different schools in one day, records 27 schools, motivational speaking in three days. It rings in my ears what he said. And you might think, big pat on the back, way to go Josh. Real strong clean, you're quick off the floor. Yeah, great triceps and deltoids, let me show you how to emphasize some of those and get better and, and show you some of the other lifts. Nah, yeah, those weren't the words. They were, Bill down, you gotta leave and don't come back. So. He knew I was from a broken home, from a dysfunctional family, and that uh, I could use some help. I couldn't read or write. I was struggling in school. I needed a mentor. I needed some help. Nah, you got to leave. Don't come back. I'm a teacher, but I'm not going to help you. And so that's my introduction to lifting. Uh, it wasn't really until I got to college in football that I, I walked in the weight room when they were recruiting me at the University of Wisconsin. And I was encouraged to do a deadlift. So I went 135, two and a quarter, 315, 405, 495, 585, call it 600 with collars. My first day, I'd never really seen an Olympic bar before. But the way I was able to be strong in that lift was that a man taught me how to work when I was a youngster. I was 12 or 13 and he was a friend of the family, Josh. He took me in the woods and abused me. It was horrible. He was a telephone linesman who could climb a telephone pole, climb a tree. He did a tree cutting service. And in, in the woods and around the lake, he trimmed and cut down trees. And the first day at work, I showed up. And he cut down two big branches. He was up that tree in about two minutes, tied in and swinging around. So I grabbed a couple little branches and I headed towards the truck. He said, drop those. Get your ass back here. I cut four or five for this hand, four or five on that hand, you reach to the bottom, drag them to the truck, and once you load them, you don't walk back, you run back. And those two big branches, start with those. Put those on the bottom of the truck. I'm thinking, what's that all about? And he said, load it from the back. And I did, and then forward, and then he cut the stump, and, and I rolled him up the hill, up into the back, over the side of the truck. And, <laughs> and here I'm 12, 13 years old, getting abused, being taught how to work. He told me, 
If you think it's hard, then it is. Tell yourself you like it. Tell yourself you're good at it. Tell yourself it's easy and run back to the truck, from the truck. And I did and I did. And I can remember we went up to a job. We cut down two trees. They were about this big around there. Elms maybe 30, 40 feet tall. We showed up at 8 o'clock in the morning on Saturday. Josh, how long do you think it took for us to, to cut down two trees, clean everything up, and leave? How many days? A couple, at least. Yeah, we showed up at 8 o'clock. He was up that tree, tied in, and dropped most of it in about 10 minutes, 15 minutes. Wow. We left at 10 o'clock. Two trees, flushed the stumps. I had it all in the truck, all raked up, cleaned up, and we were gone. He taught me how to work. Work ethics and, and the, the energy that you put forth really is, as we know, as you know, and many things to cover here is in your mind, but you asked me where I started, and I think that's one of the most important things is learning how to work, not being afraid of work, and being, being willing, ready to put out a, a lot of energy uh, because something is only heavy if you think it is. So I'm pulling on that chainsaw. It was a, a two, two-man chainsaw, 18-horse Wisconsin with about a five-and-a-half, six-foot blade. I pulled on some stumps that were maybe 48, 50 inches. I pulled and I pulled, hoping that that chain was sharp. As I pulled and pulled, I'm in a low position, heels dug in, pulling for 10, 15 minutes as he's got the easy part working the chain. Yeah. So around, I got the, the work end. Uh, so thereby translating to a 600 deadlift the first time I ever saw it. When I showed up on the football field in junior high and high school, it was trouble for all the other kids because I was big, fast, strong, and knew how to work, and uh, part of the story. Didn't you have the school record in the 100-meter dash and the shot put or something, too, in high school? Yes, I did. So as a freshman, I was a nose guard. We played five games. We won all five. The last game, the running back came by me holding a watermelon. So I snatched it out of his hands and went 75 yards the other way. End of season, end of story, until I'm a sophomore. And my coach said, Bill, stand back here behind the quarterback. And we got holes of two, four, six, eight, one, three, five, seven. Put your hands like this. And when we call the number of your play, you got the ball. We went 10 and 0. Wow. And as a junior, same sort of thing with the powerhouse backfield. As a senior, our biggest lineman was 190 pounds. We were quick. My coach made sure that. He brought shoes in from Taiwan that were so light. We were f just fast. 190-pound defensive end, I was 222 in the backfield. <laughs> and the fastest on the team. It was ugly what I did in football. I thought it would be a great future going to the University of Wisconsin. Yeah. But some things happened with my grades, and I was not eligible. Still managed to get into Wisconsin on a five-year program for hardship cases. Wasn't able to play as a freshman. As a sophomore, they moved me to defensive tackle and put two freshmen ahead of me. Well, in the spring game, uh, coming back, the spring game I made seven solos and 13 assists. Guess what, Josh? I knew the plays because as a freshman, I was a fullback. So when the quarterback <laughs> called the plays, I went to where the ball was. They got pissed and put me in third string, so I quit. So you were in Madison, Wisconsin. That was sort of like a hotbed of powerlifting back then, huh? It really was. Here's what happened when I stopped playing football, dropped out of school. Yeah. I lived above the pub. I was a bouncer there and a dangle in a few places. It was really at a time in my life where things were really messed up. Things were not going well. The measure of a man is how you react on a bad day. Yeah. And for me, I gravitated towards the YMCA, where Mike Morgan, Bubba, 565 bench, 765 squat, 805 deadlift. Mm -hmm. Bob Lowry, 242-pound world ch er, state champion. Pretty big lifter. A lot, of, a lot of good guys. I snuck in the back door of the YMCA. They left a wedge there for me. I couldn't afford to pay. All of a sudden, the wedge was gone one day, and I went to the front and walked up the stairs, kind of timid and shy, sneaking in. They got the front desk said, Hi, Bill. Welcome to the Y. Want a towel? I was gifted a membership in the middle 70s, which was really strange. You know, the YMCA, what a remarkable place, 170 years old. Yeah. They started in England. They saved many people's lives. They helped me a lot. They taught me five things, <clears throat> squat, bench, deadlift, and total. 
Squat, I did a 930. Bench, I did world record 661. Deadlift, I did world record 887. Total, I did world record 1100 kilos, 2425. The most important thing that they taught me was the fifth thing. And they taught me that pretty quick. And they said, put your hands together and put your head down. Just start talking to the Lord. I knew what to say, simply. Make me the best. I'll be humble. I'll share my talents with others. One day you can speak through me, and I'll work for you. That was the prayer. And it was answered. Well, you know, the funny thing is that about three, four weeks later, I went to the state meet. I took my boots. I really wasn't going to lift. I thought I'd maybe do a workout. And the last guy in the squat did a 650, and he missed a 700. So I took it and did five. The regionals were coming up, and I was getting prepared for that. But in that picture, they took a picture of me. In the picture, above my head, is a 4-inch by 18-inch perfect spiral of light. It might have had something to do with what it said in the Bible as I walked out of the Y. I read down the Psalms. It said, I waited patiently, O Lord, for you to hear my cries. You reached down and pulled me out of a miry pit. You put my feet onto a rock and established my goings. You put a new song into my heart, even praise unto the Lord. Many will see and will fear and will trust in the Lord. Well, my promise was make me the best. I'll share it with others. I'll be humble. 27 schools in three days, 10 schools in one day, offering a message of hope and inspiration for young people to dare to dream and shoot for the stars and soar with the eagles, hang out with the condors and stay away from the chickens and turkeys. And thank the Lord for every day that they're alive and vow to make every day the best they can, every day in every way. So I was really affected by the lifters in Madison in those middle 70s. And it prepped me to become senior national champ, world champ, world's strongest man in the whole career. It all kind of started there. I think many things to say, but I think that I talk about the trampoline of life. At that point, I was at the bottom of the trampoline. I was, like my dad, reinforced horse shit and nothing else but. But from the bottom of that trampoline, I pushed as hard as I could, just like a squat. I started to come up to mediocrity, average, good, great, excellent, ticker tape parade, Olympic Games gold medalist, whatever you might imagine. The trampoline of life is something that I suggest young people use, all lifters. Because if you started off with a golden spoon or silver spoon in your mouth and you never heard a swear word and around the house and, you know, it was so bad growing up. I can't imagine what it's like for a youngster to have a, an opportunity, to have a, a mentor like Fred Hatfield. Yeah, yeah. Uh, people that could really teach and encourage and inspire and motivate and, and educate all at the same time that were encouraging. What's that all about? Didn't happen for me, so I sort of had to fight and scratch my way, and I did it my way. Like Frank Sinatra. There we go. I can't <laughs> sing like that, though, I'm afraid. <laughs> um, so you crossed paths with, Frank, with Fred and Joe Bradley and those guys? I did. Wisconsin? I did, and it was... Because uh, Fred had a gym there when he's a professor, huh? Yeah, and I slept on the floor in that gym, in the locker yeah, room. Yeah, he told me that. He said, that's how committed you were, is you were not going like, to let anything get in your way. You, he yeah. let you sleep on the floor there, and you did it, and yep. trained. And I asked for help one day and uh, from Fred, because I was going to squat, and, I, and his words of encouragement were simply, I'll squat 700 before you, Kazmaier. That's all it took. He didn't, but <laughs> but he did squat a thousand, and I didn't. Yeah. And uh, Fred was one of the most unbelievable lifters. Came from gymnastics. His body was yeah. all torn up. Did Olympic lifting. Really ruins the body. Yeah. And then through the power lifts, just excelled to the point where not only were his training techniques rather revolutionary, but it was just his understanding of the body chemistry, how it works. I mean, I think the body is electrochemical. I think the cerebral cortex in the brain has. Well, obviously, so much to do for the the BAM factor and the ability to recruit muscle fiber against a joint through a range of motion and do the activities that we do in lifting. But Fred had all that to a science, and uh, we all learned a lot from him. Let's talk about a little bit about how you were, um, you know, I think now kind of power bodybuilding is more in style, but I think you were one of the, for sure, one of the first people that uh, kind of revolutionized because I, uh, I wrote a book, it's called uh, Metroflex Gym Powerbuilding Basics, I don't have it here, but it, you were one of the people that I, I actually was trying to get in touch with you, 
talked about you a lot, just about like how your influence was there. And I think, because what we had talked about before, you were doing more reps, more volume, you're what they call density training. Now you're trying to get it done in a shorter amount of time, so. Yeah, bigger the base, higher the peak. If you only do a little bit of work, it's gonna be a pretty small peak. If you do ego lifting and just do singles all the time, that's all you're ever gonna do is a single. I trained and roomed with Mike Bridges back in those uh, late 70s, early 80s era. And uh, he said he did singles for six weeks out. I don't know how he did it. I went from 12 weeks away from 15s on the light day, 10s on the heavy day, to 12s and 8s, 10s and 5s. Imagine my light day in bench doing sets of 12 at 473. Yeah. That's my light day, four sets. Uh, the volume was, was there. And one of the professors from the University of Florida, Florida State, said to me, Bill, you're 30 years ahead of your time. We're now realizing that if we use a submaximal weight, it goes fast as we can. I mean, I didn't just bench. I benched yeah. like a freaking machine. Everything that I did, I did as hard and fast as I could. I did as much as I could. I really believe that there's a red light, green light going on. Most guys get to a point where they think they're done, they reach out, red switch, tag out, they're finished. I rewired my switches so that when I was at that point where I was totally shot, all the lactic acid's building up, the muscles are screaming, the brain's saying, that's all you can do, that's all you can do. The body says, stop, you can't take any more pain. When I hit the switch, it was actually the green switch, and boom! Boom, 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 boom. Yeah. I went from there to failure. Not that at that point where your body says you're going to fail. And I don't think people in my ear, I don't know if anybody today is doing it the way I did it. The, the lifters today that say they're stronger and are doing a lot really aren't doing the volume. I don't know, they're using their gear and their clothing to effectively leverage and move more weight. But what, what, Yeah, what do you think about powerlifting gear? Yeah, not much, but uh, because to back up, you know, the, it's, it's that synapse and it's a, that mental thought process. You see, some of the things I think that are really pertinent are like in squatting, I did non-lockout squats yeah. so that I was under constant tension. I wish I would have had bands. And how and high would you take the, so you go, so just pictures go to the bottom, he's coming up and where do you stop? How far from the lock? About four fifths. Okay. I don't stand, breathe. See if anybody's watching, grunt, groan, try to get some attention from the girls. Post it on Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> go set my, reset my phone, get back into the bar. Uh, it's literally like a sewing machine. Boom, 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 yeah, boom, yeah. boom. As hard and fast as you can. Imagine 775 for five sets of five. Uh, outside the rack, no spotters. Pretty tough stuff. Yeah. Uh, what that does when you're, uh, when you're coming th three quarters of the way up and going back in, it kind of gives you the ability, if you're ever out of the groove, to kind of fight through it and fight Big out of time. it. I wouldn't do my heaviest lifts non-lockout, but I did a bunch of non-lockout squats. My favorite ones that I think back about, and some of my heaviest cycles are high bar for a, a leverage disadvantage, yeah. narrow stance, much more work on the quads, sets of 15 at 650, Bam. nearly 300 kilos. And that was before heavy deadlifts so that I would save my back and blow up my quads so that I really was using my low back for deadlifts. But then the deadlifts, of course, were 805 for three fives, eight and a quarter for two fives. Um, we did some pretty heavy lifting. So forgive you me. You pulled 900 ex 905 in exhibition too, right, in gym shorts? Yeah, 900, but uh, back at that time, you know, we never dreamt that you could dip underneath the bar, you could do a, a strong man lift, you could use straps. If I would have used those things and had that mindset and specialized on deadlift for a little while, I think I could have lifted a little bit more. I would think so. <laughs> Fair you know, guess. Well, Josh, you know, I'm not sure who your heroes were growing up. You were one of them. Thank you. But I had a few. And Ed Cohn. And, uh... Yeah, Ed was, he was a little bit bef uh, after my yeah. time, but I was really, really strong and, and very noticeable in even in his early meets. But the guys that motivated me through history, Jim Thorpe, the great Carlisle Native American. Yep. Not only did he win the pentathlon and the decathlon at the Olympic Games, he played professional football and professional baseball. And believe it or not, around that time, the early 1900s, there were some Native Americans that were, 
the Pop Warner thing, if you really get into it and understand what it is, it was a machine to pump out athletes for sports. And um, he, he was something to be admired. You know, I, I often talk about the measure of a man is your ability to overcome. Jim Thorpe overcame a lot of stuff. So did my cousin Dick Kazmaier, who at Princeton University in 1951 had a small line. He had a scamper and scatter. And he panicked and threw the ball. First guy to do it as a halfback. He ran over the Ivy League. He did a quick kick. He won the Heisman Trophy. It's guys like that that I look up to. Uh, Ronnie Coleman right now, if you look at him. Yeah. Unbelievable. Busted in the back. Was a monster. Now he's coming back. That measure of man is, is so important as to, you know, who you really are. So. Big time. So what, let's talk a little about your eating because I know um, a lot of people are going to be under the impression they're eating a lot to gain weight. And, you know, then they write it down and it's not a whole lot. So what would what, it look like for you? Oh, gosh. We went to the buffet. We, we really messed up our time frame because we know, you know, do you know, there's an anabolic window, a window of opportunity within 90 minutes of a workout that all of homeostasis is finished. Yeah. You have to get in with the good, out with the bad during that time period. And if you put beef, if you ingest beef after the workout, it's four hours from ingesting to the bloodstream. Chicken and fish, two and a half hours. Milk and egg, an hour and a half. Powdered protein, about an hour. You've got 90 minutes after the workout to get it in the bloodstream. Well, it's easy to mess up. We would leave the workout, and one of my meals was 50 pieces of chicken. <laughs> Thighs of drumsticks. I was up against my training partner eating 40 and 45 breasts, so he was eating a lot more than me. Problem is, it's two and a half hours after ingestion till it's in the bloodstream, which means you're not using it. Yeah. Yeah. So we ran the buffet out of, out of business, but we really didn't get it in at the right time. Now we realize that that's got to be ingested some two hours before the workout to, or else using amino acids and those sorts of things. High quality proteins right during or before the workout is really important for recovery. But how much to eat? We took our blender. We didn't have a ninja. We take our blender, throw in eggs, powdered milk. We didn't have protein. Uh, whole milk few other proteins and uh, as we mixed it when the motor started to smoke we shut it off we scraped down the sides with a spatula and we slammed it and we did that a few times during the day oftentimes in the middle of the night we'd get up and eat a whole chicken and a protein shake so calories a lot five ten thousand at a meal <laughs> that's and, crazy in all seriousness uh, it's like a job. That's that's hardcore. What about um, so? Let's talk a little about the strongman. So, you were um, obviously, I, I'd say the the kind of what they, what happened with it. They wouldn't invite you back or whatever because you dominated so. Oh, much. there's just so many stories about strongman. I don't know that we really want to get into them because sure. the problem with the strongman stuff for me is that I had some highlights, and in a life in a lifetime of hardships, mm -hmm. those highlights are now gone because. I seem to dwell on the negativity uh, surrounding my strongman experiences. I mean, don't forget Sweden for powerlifting in 83, and I'll tell that story. Sure. But uh, there's been a little favoritism in strongman from its inception till present. That said, I dominated Jeff Capes so completely in one year, beat him by t almost 28 points. They moved the show over to England. Why? I think because Franco Colombo fell under the refrigerator, snapped his leg, and won a lawsuit for $2.4 million. Oh. Arnold got on stage and said, he lost a lot of work, he lost a lot of money, blah, blah. Here's two and a half million bucks. The company said, wow, ship it back to England, TWI. Well, who are we going to invite? Uh, Dave Waddington, a uh, few other guys from America, powerlifters, Doyle Kennedy. What about that guy that won three times in a row? Ah, nah. We might want Capes to win. Or the new kid, John Paul Sigmerson. So I wasn't invited. In 30 years of pain, I said, 
I sat by the phone. It didn't ring. I cried. I went to the mailbox. The letter invite wasn't there. Bullshit. I didn't cry. Kaz doesn't cry. I didn't really care. I went to the Powerlifting World Championships in 1983 and uh, wasn't invited to World's Strongest Man. When I was... Did you train for the strong man or did you just no. show up and do it? When you were going? When yeah, was... when you're really, really strong, you don't need to practice the events, Josh. And I was really, and really strong. And you're so explosive compared to other guys, too. So well, anybody it, else strong, I mean, you're stronger already, but you're so much more explosive. Than... Here was the technique for practice. Watch nine other wannabes, guys fighting for second place, do an event and learn from their mistakes and their successes. And then synthesize that, strain it, take the best from it, and dominate. I think if we were going to talk about Kazmaier and a legacy, we would have to think about you know, the difference that he's made, but the measure of a man is how you react on a bad day. I was an overcomer. Mm -hmm. I was a striver. I was continually victorious. To set that legacy in stone, take, for instance, one of the strongman shows. We went 870 in the squat. I tore kind of like hamstring adductor, went. Then I wrapped it. We went 950 and I tore the other one. Well, Josh, next lift is deadlift. What are you going to do? Two torn hammies. You won. Yeah, but what would you do if you tore both your legs and the next is deadlift? You can't bend your legs. Yeah. You can't use your legs. Our internet warriors say, Kazmar doesn't know how to deadlift. Just think if he would have bent his legs and he had a little better efficient form, how much he would have lifted. Well, I went 700 for the opener, 800, 900. Now it's me and Ernie Hackett. 925, 50, 75, 1,000, 1,000, 1,050. Everybody else is resting. I, we tied for the event at 1,055. Ernie Hackett was very happy to be able to do that. But there I am doing it with two torn legs in the steel bar bend. I tear the pectoral and deltoid. There's four events left. My doctor says, Bill, we got to go to the hospital. You've torn your chest. Who knows what's, what you ripped off? I thought it was maybe just a little tendon or something that I'd been having a problem with. There were four events left. I said, Doc, I'm not going to the hospital. Not until I finish business because I've got my title, my trophy, and my check on the line. And I'm not leaving until I take them. And out of those four events, I took two firsts, a third, and a fourth. So... My legacy would then be overcoming adversity, overcoming all odds. When the chips are stacked, stacked against you at Huntley Castle, the dethroning of a legend, Capes, Sigmerson, and myself, I was told there'd be nine events. We could each pick three. In Douglas Edmonds' book, he writes, Well, me and Capes and John Paul and Kaz sat around over a Guinness and decided the events. Bullshit. That's made up, brother. I didn't get to pick three events. As a matter of fact, I said, well, if you won't, you're not going to tell me the events. Just make sure of one thing. In the deadlift, give me a one-inch bar. No, no problem, Kaz. Anything for you. Huh. Anything but fights fair and square. John Paul Sigmerson did, over 12 weeks, he did two comps a week, 24 competitions. They took his best events, wouldn't tell me what they were, and put them in the Huntley Castle. In the deadlift, they used a set of carousel wheels with a slab of steel this big. That's a one-inch bar, huh? Okay, anything for Bill. Well, Bill Anderson, the Highland Games World Championship was, Champion, was the referee in deadlift. I wasn't watching John Paul because I was deadlifting the bar. John Paul figured out a way over those 12 weeks to slip underneath the bar and just stand up. Wasn't a deadlift. Quarter squat, sorry. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I really got frustrated at that competition. John Paul, or Jeff Capes just kind of quit. He's a quitter. Uh, but uh, a lot of those times, take for instance, when I took first place against Capes, and Lars Hedlund was definitely in third place. But if I would tug a war against Jeff Capes, then he would move into second and Capes would take third. And Lars offered me a thousand bucks, the network offered me a thousand bucks. So I'd tug a war against Capes in what was really a, a mistake. 
It lasted nine minutes. I pulled and pulled and got him about a meter, and I held. I found a rock. I put my heel against the rock, and I had my rope below my belt. Capes' rope came above his belt. The leverage was really tough on him. He we finally he quit, finished. It took nine minutes. My hip was numb for six months. I had nerve damage on it. I pulled so hard. But uh, I'll tell you my two favorite thing watching you do strongman, and there's two things. John Gamble, sumo wrestle. Yeah, Dave Waddington also. Yeah, that one. And then there was uh, um, one where the kegs. Because everybody else is picking up those kegs yep. and running with them, and you just figured out you could throw them. Well, mine were empty. Yeah. Your perception of reality is reality. Whatever you perceive to be true is true. I convinced myself through, call it hypnosis or positive mental imagery, the motion picture of the mind, yeah. if you see it enough times and you do it in your mind, then you simply, in the gym, see it and do it. And uh, it's all systematic to me and, uh, and really not that difficult or that complicated. But So for the wrestling against John Gamble and Dave Waddington, that was the second event the next morning after tearing the legs in the squat and the deadlift. I couldn't walk. I didn't know what to do. I couldn't bend down and touch the ground. So against John Gamble, I just started hitting myself in the head. Yeah. <laughs> and acting a little bit crazy. I think it got his attention because he ran out of the ring. I guess I did bulldoze him out. But you bulldoze him out. And with Dave Waddington, we were slapping and hitting each other. Next thing you know, he tripped and fell and I landed on top of him, like Pee Wee Herman. Oh, I meant to do that. <laughs> if you watch closely, though, when I go to help Dave Waddington back off the mat. Look at my face closely as I pull him up. Oh, big mistake. Because he, I helped him up. My legs hurt so bad. I went, Wince, why did I do that? Because I'm a gentleman, because I'm a good sportsman, because I'm stupid, because I shouldn't have tried to help him up. And, uh, but overcoming obstacles, the measure of a man is how you react on a bad day. My legacy is how I overcame adversity and beat the competition, beat their promoters, beat them with their events and their referees. What about mental strategies? I know you're, I think you kind of pioneered a lot of that in strength sports is, I mean, that's huge. I, yeah. think, I think that'd be a huge takeaway for people watching. Well, we just covered one of them where, yeah, you know, like to go in depth your perception of yeah. your reality. Um, you know, after a workout mm -hmm. in the evening, in bed, you're meditating, about to fall asleep. One of my healing practices today is probably understood. Back in the 70s, no one thought of it. I had one million nurses, doctors, therapists, nutritionists that were nano, micronized. And they started at my toes like a laser beam and they went across every cell of my body. And they were within homeostasis, in with the good, out with the bad, healing. With every breath, every inhalation was positive, energetic, uh, healing properties of oxygen. Every exhalation was all the toxins and poisons leaving my body. As it came up through my chest and up to my head, I convinced myself that I was going to have the best night's sleep of my life. That when I woke in the morning, even though I did these horrific workouts of 50, 60 sets, that my body was going to be completely healed, and I got to the top of my head and fell asleep. But at another time before that, I would use that motion picture. I would go into the gym mentally mm -hmm. and see myself working out that day, analyze and critique everything that I did, all the reps, all the sets, the time sequence, the rest between the sets, their frequency, the pace, the whole workout, and I just run it through my computer. Categorize, analyze, ABC123. I had a place and an understanding for just about a comprehension for everything that went on. Uh, even the prep before each one of them. The breathing. The psych. The synapses. The snap. The acceleration. How every set felt. And I'd kind of categorize, put that away for another day. But I'd, great, I'd gain an understanding, comprehension from that workout of where I am 
because you set a goal. It's conceivable, even achieved. Pick a goal, short term or long. Develop a plan to get to the goal. Believe in the plan, believe in the goal, believe in yourself. Uh, believe that he wants you to do it. Then, with that understanding, I would then play the motion picture of the next day. The lifts I was going to do, the weights I was going to use, the pace, frequency, the psych. I'd try to smell the smells of the gym. I'd hear the sounds. I'd see the sights, the other people within the gym. Because like, vivid is all get out. Just like it was happening. Yeah. Again and again and again. You know, you can prep and say, well, I'm getting ready for my 12-week cycle. I'm <laughs> trying real hard. I get there on time. I leave after 30 minutes because I got it all done. Sorry, I'm from the South. Mm -hmm. I got a Southern draw, or I used to. <laughs> uh, so I think a lot of people maybe just don't uh, don't quite get it as far as mental prep, but you know there's many techniques, and I believe that you can gain a lot from the Eastern philosophy and meditation. And there again, if you really believe that something has happened, is going to happen, and you have prepped yourself for it to happen, you can then make so it happen. So how often would you meditate? Oh, gosh. My meditation started back in college and trying to get an understanding of why was I lost and where was I. Here's a, you will like this story, Josh. <clears throat> you could talk, I'll stop for a drink. Yeah, I mean, this is, this is huge. We've talked before about um, a lot of times about successful mindset, about um, called mental movies, and this is awesome hearing, hearing this from Cass, too. It's a hell of an endorsement. <laughs> so, Josh. Yeah, you get a lot of this stuff. I'm, man, I'm amazed. What you write, what you know, that you're able to communicate it to other people. I've yet to come up with mine, hopefully. Looking forward to reading it. Yeah, hopefully soon. But yeah, here, you hear that, guys? He's coming out with a book, so make, we'll make sure we'll put up a link to it when it comes out. Fantastic. So here's a trip to Mexico after I dropped out of college. I went in the gym. <clears throat> I had been training for a couple months. I weighed 280 pounds, all natural. I benched 315 for five sets of five. Mm -hmm. I left and went to the Yucatan. I visited Palenque, Chetamol, Chichen Itza, Uxmal, Tulum, did a lot of swimming, a little bit of running, a lot of, a lot of diving, snorkeling. <clears throat> I stayed for six months. The day I came back, I weighed 210 pounds. I didn't touch a weight. Here's the catcher, and only you will get it. Will you get this? I did three sets of five at 315 in the bench. Didn't lose much. It wasn't, but I, about a year later, I'm national and then world champion and world's strongest man. The things that happened down there that were really special were going to these different ruins and tapping into something, some supernatural power, something that almost made me superhuman in strength. I think it was that power of prayer and meditation, the spiral of light, uh, those promises that I will be humble and share my talents with others. It's the purity of purpose. It's like a ship at sea in the 1700s with a precious cargo. It's got to get from shore to shore through those rough seas. If it's a selfless act that you're doing, that's selfless, not selfish. <laughs> you dingbats. That's a big difference. <laughs> yeah. If it is a selfless act, you're sails are pinned against your mast and the cargo is moving rapidly with gale winds pushing it. I didn't just break the bench press record of 606, uh, 611 I guess Lars Hedlund. It stood at 600 pounds for a decade and uh, I moved it within less than a year from 617, 6. 22, 33, 39, 61, should have done 85, could probably have done 700. If I would have specialized, Josh, on bench press for just eight weeks, 12 weeks, I would have done seven, seven and a quarter. I told Ryan Kinley, who's a great bencher, yeah. that I was stronger than him, and I told him why. You know, I told him if I would have specialized on bench press for a year, no squats or deads, 800 raw. Not a problem. Because I had hydraulic cylinders that came off of a huge caterpillar, bulldozer, 
with big hydraulic springs that came off of a train. And as the bar came down, I was just loading. And when I got the, stuff, the bench signal, boom! You know, here's one that I think people might enjoy. If you move a weight slow, you're always going to be slow. But if you move it fast, you're going to stimulate a lot more tissue. As the professor from Florida State University said, Bill, you're 30 years ahead of your time. That's how you build muscle and strength. Muscle's all or none. I think that's it's the maximum difference improvement. between weak people and strong people. Is a lot of strong people inherently get that, whether they know it or not. It's moving it from point A to point B as fast as possible. Mm -hmm. Without a doubt. And I use three words, Josh. Trick, beat, kill. What is it? Trick, beat, kill. Okay. You're going to kill the lightweights. Pow, 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 pow. You're going to beat the medium weights. Boom, boom, boom. And you're going to trick the heaviest weights. Maybe with a little bounce, maybe uh, a little arch, a little movement. It's going to be a little slower, but you're going to trick it. And you just keep moving that up. Trick, beat, kill. How important do you think, with, speaking of your bench, to all the accessory <coughs> that you did, like besides just benching, because obviously you're doing bodybuilding movements mm -hmm. and stuff to assist you? Well, to, to reiterate that it, if I, if I would have focused, I could have probably done an 800 pound raw yeah. bench. Where I did salt and pepper shaker, tricep presses, Kaz presses with an easy bar. I started with three plates for 20, and then a 10, and another 10, up to about four, a little over four plates for sets of 20. I did maybe eight sets. Uh, I didn't do tricep press downs because, as we know, you're limited by your trunk strength and your ability to stay over the over the cable. So it's a really feeble exercise. For those of you who do, do tricep kickbacks to strengthen your tricep, uh, you can stop those because I don't work. <laughs> but if you pin yourself on a decline bench and Josh is above me lifting off and the bar, my lower arm and upper arm are all in a straight line and I have a 10 inch wide grip and I get a maximum stretch and flex, fairly short, boom, 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 fairly heavy, high rep sets, a lot of volume to build. If I would have increased my tricep press both supine and decline by 25%, thereby in more deltoids, more work in bench, that 800 would have been extremely feasible. And for those who think that I'm full of shit, I'm not. What about front raises and lateral raises? You did those real heavy too, huh? Did a lot, yeah. If I, I did up to 100 pounds both ways, sometimes a little bit more in exhibitions. Uh, if I would have increased the volume there. I also did a lot of overhead uh, seated presses, mm -hmm. Smith presses. And there again, as close to the chin as possible, big stretch. As we know, the deltoid's a really short muscle. Yeah. It only works from here to here. So hard and fast, heavy. Uh, there again, as much work in a shorter period of time as one can. You know, the, the, the variable that many of us miss, you and I catch this, is the rest between sets. That's a variable that's sometimes more important than the, the resistance. Because often a beginner intermediate guy will be really hungry for resistance, but he won't realize that he'll keep slowing down and increasing the rest between sets to the point where he sort of hits a peak. But if, if you establish yourself with a, a certain amount of resistance and then keep decreasing the rest between sets, for instance, you're resting a, a minute and a half, then a minute and 15, then a minute, more overload then. Yep. They call it density. That's what people, you hear everybody talk about density training now. This is pretty much the guy that invented it, and you know, and, but that's a term people use for it now. It's exactly, you're trying to make it more dense, exactly. And then add weight and yeah. go to a longer rest. But for me, you have to realize that in bench press and, and call them power bodybuilding exercises for auxiliary, I hardly rested. They were like supersets or uh, 15 to 30 seconds, just boom, boom, boom. We call it recovery. I, I guess I called it cardio because your heart rate was, who knows, uh, approaching 200 and then dropping back down. Here's some of the training that I did back in the day for Strongest Man. And I, I guarantee there's been nobody in history that's ever equaled this. I did stadium steps with a vest, 40 pounds, 15 pound dumbbells, ankle weights, and lace weights because they were cool. <laughs> I did sets of five up the stadiums. What do you mean sets of five? Up, down, up, down, up, okay, down. Okay, I got you. Yeah. Yep. Take my heart rate. 
I heard it was like 246 or something. You're on it, Josh. It was <laughs> 25 beats. I've been wanting to do this interview for a long, long time, so then trust me. 30 beats in yeah. 10 seconds, then 35. 41 beats in 10 seconds for a 246. When we were getting ready for a competition, I would carry a sack, then drag a sack, then push a truck, till the point where the body's musculature was in tetany. It was just lack of synchronization and it, it could, couldn't even stand up. So we'd sit on the truck and push some more. I guarantee you nobody's training like that. Not now, not ever, not ever since then. So it's that amount of volume and the frequency. I trained seven days a week. I took two days off from heavy squat and partial deadlifts and then did heavy deadlifts and high bar squats. And again, two days between benches. And if 473 for 12s is my light day in bench, just think what the heavy day is. Could you do overloads besides the partial, de like any of the partial deadlifts, any overloads for squat or bench ever? Yeah. What, like what? Uh, I got, I took my power rack, which was a, a four inch tube with a, uh, forgive me, four and a half inch tube with a four inch inside diameter okay. to slip and welded the pads, drilled holes in them so I could put bolts through. The bar was connected to the rack. Uh, about five inches, four inches high, I did a thousand for five starting out of the bottom. Wow. Yeah. But uh, there again, one really big problem for me was that I was so well developed in the chest and shoulders, I could not fit inside the bar. The you saw standard, nowadays with that longer bar. Yeah, Passanella did that. We, God rest his soul. What a great squatter. He told me he was going to squat a thousand someday, and uh, I think he came close. Yeah, he got over a thousand. Yeah, he got over he didn't go below parallel or didn't go to parallel. And in talking about that, Josh, you know this all too well, that when you squat, you can go right here, about an inch, two inches high, but as soon as you drop down, you now have to give up your hips and low back. It actually has to rotate down and then come up. One of the guys that taught me this is Marvin Phillips, 8'11 at 242 back in the 70s. Yeah. Fantastic squatter, but he had these was glutes. He like cop or something? Yeah, he was. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. He could take his hips, break his low back, roll them down, go below parallel, reset them, and come up. Passanella couldn't do that. Every inch of depth, 40 pounds, they say. Well, there's a, a lot of our great squatters today. If you take our Russian search of, yeah. hell of a squatter. Look at the flexibility of the shoulders. I couldn't fit inside the bar. Uh, I don't know if he's just a specialist in squat, how he can st maintain such flexibility, um, but he hits a point where he's still in a perfect position. He hasn't given up those hips. So if the referees say he's parallel, then he's parallel. But back in the old school, that's not deep enough. Everything was deep back then. Yeah, you know, if you didn't... Uh, the 90s you know, is when they started letting people start to get away with stuff a little more. Really hard, yeah, hard telling at, the, at which and when. I have saw some squats of guys that, back in my time, that were a couple inches high that seemed to pass, and others didn't, so I don't know about all that.